sandwiched between the prominent 1996 class and the 1998 class. While 1996 was deemed a top 3 class of all time, which included guys like Allen Iverson, Kobe Bryant, sharpshooters Ray Allen and Peja Stojakovic, China's finest Stefan Marbury, two-time MVP Steve Nash, Jermaine O'Neal, and the undrafted Ben Wallace. In total, there were 11 different players who became an all-star from the 96 class. Then, in 1998, there were six all-stars, headlined by Dirk Nowitzki, Paul Pierce, and Vince Carter. But then, there's 1997. The year which only had three stars. And you know, when drafts don't have that many stars, it's not the end of the world. At least it's usually not. It was such a top-heavy draft with most of the weights being carried by Tim Duncan, and the rest of the class got crushed underneath it. It really was that bad. Anyway, how's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, let's talk about the famous, or infamous, 1997 NBA draft class. Who was in this class? What will it be remembered for? And why did it end up being so bad? But before I start, I'd like to give a shout out to my sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers a wide array of classes, self-discovery, and a sense of fulfillment. Learning is essential in times of hardship to get your mind focused on a goal that you want to achieve. It offers classes that include illustration, graphic design, web development, marketing, creative writing, and much, much more. Personally, I've always loved typography and digital illustration, so I'd recommend this class by Jeanette Liao. Skillshare is very affordable and helpful for your own future endeavors. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get two free months of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Alright, let's get started. First, everyone knows who the number one pick was, Tim Duncan, a four-year college player from Wake Forest. The consensus number one pick without a doubt. The only reason he stayed that long in college was because his late mother, who passed away from breast cancer, wanted him and his siblings to finish college and graduate. However, it was well known that if Duncan left early, he would have been a lottery pick regardless. But now, he was more mature and more prepared than ever, as he made an immediate impact right when he stepped onto the NBA court. Now, I won't cover Duncan's entire career, as we all know how good he was. 15-time All-Star, 5-time Champion, 2-time MVP, 3-times Finals MVP, and without a doubt, a first ballot Hall of Famer. Two spots down the draft, you had Chauncey Billups. Initially, Billups had a very slow start to his career. He would play for four different teams in his first five seasons, and it wasn't until he joined Detroit where he saw consistent playing time. With the Pistons, he would mark his legacy as they rose into prominence as one of the best teams in the entire league. In 2004, he would lead them to a stunning victory over the heavily favored Los Angeles Lakers, capturing the finals MVP and his first and only championship, as he made his mark as one of the greatest leaders in NBA history. Then, you go down a bit and you got Tracy McGrady with the ninth overall pick. Initially drafted by Toronto, he's more known for his time in Orlando and Houston. One of the most athletic and dynamic scorers in the history of the game, a guy who many believed was on equal footing with his contemporaries, especially Kobe Bryant during their early days. Unfortunately, the fall of McGrady was quite tragic as the injuries piled on as he got older. He would still finish his career as a 7-time All-Star, a 2-time scoring champion, and a Hall of Famer. Now, here comes the exciting part. Let's talk about everyone else in this class. There's a lot of names you won't recognize, so I'll go over the players who had a solid impact throughout their careers. Guys who you probably would know if you watched the NBA in the early 2000s. The second pick of the draft was Keith Van Horn. You might recognize him from those New Jersey Nets teams, the ones led by Jason Kidd. Van Horn was a starter and averaged about 18 points per game in his five years in Jersey. He was also on the cover of NBA Jam in 1999. His most memorable moment came in the 2002 Eastern Conference Finals. Kittles inside, Van Horn for three! Bang! Keith Van Horn from down! 
Van Horn hit the game-winning shot to win Game 6, and pushed the Nets to the NBA Finals, where they would get swept. Despite a strong start to his career, even averaging nearly 22 points a game in his sophomore season, he could not build on that. Maybe it was a lack of motivation, or the injuries that kept hampering him. His former coach, Byron Scott, even said, I think he was pretty satisfied with what he had. He worked hard in practice, but he never went the extra mile. He seemed to be kind of fine with the skills that God gave him. After just eight years in the NBA, he retired at the age of 30. The fourth pick of the draft, Antonio Daniels. He was basically the prototypical backup point guard. He was actually a backup point guard for basically his entire career, which isn't exactly what you want out of the fourth pick. With career averages of about 7 points and 3 assists per game, Daniels did not live up to anything, despite being the pride of Bowling Green State, as one of the best players in their college's history. You might recognize him more from his post-NBA career, where he's been working as an analyst for multiple sports networks. The fifth pick, Tony Battee, a 6 foot 11 big man who was also a role player for his entire career. While he was never an adept scorer or a fantastic defender, Batty has always been a great teammate and veteran presence for every team he's been on. He was also the guy who saved Paul Pierce after he got stabbed 11 times at a nightclub. Batty was the guy who got him out of there and brought him to the hospital. Similar to Antonio Daniels, Batty also had a rather long career. Both of them played for 14 seasons, and despite never being stars, their professionalism and mentorship were very attractive for teams who needed some veteran guidance. The sixth pick, Ron Mercer. After a successful college career where he helped Kentucky win the 1996 NCAA title, he fell flat in the NBA. Early on, Mercer was known as a relentless chucker, which is why he got traded numerous times. In fact, in his eight seasons in the NBA, Mercer would play for seven different teams. He was essentially the tank commander for some horrendous teams. And even from the beginning, teams around the league recognized him as a bust. The seventh pick, Tim Thomas. You might recognize him for his time on the Milwaukee Bucks and Phoenix Suns. Thomas played alongside Ray Allen and was part of the Bucks team that reached the 2001 Eastern Conference Finals. Then, in 2006, Thomas didn't stay in Phoenix for a long time, but in the time he did play, he had the most memorable highlight of his career. A game 6 of the first round, he would hit the game-tying 3, sending it to overtime. The Suns won the game in overtime, then blew out the Lakers in game 7 as they completed their comeback after being down 3 games to 1. Thomas was a huge part of that turnaround. Overall, if you look at the first 10 picks of this class, it was god-awful outside of those three stars. Way too many players underachieved, way too many never lived up to their college hype, and you can extend that to the rest of the first round. Many of these guys you've probably never even heard of. That's how short and irrelevant their careers were. Before I dive into some other notable players in the later part of the draft, why do you think the 1997 class was so weak? Most writers and analysts put it as a bottom 10 draft of all time. But the truth is, the hype surrounding the draft was very minimal to begin with. In the previous year, 1996, there was a ton of hype, a lot of incoming talent that we knew would become very good players. But in 97, there was very little excitement outside of Tim Duncan. Whoever got the first pick that year, regardless if it was San Antonio or Philadelphia or Boston, Tim Duncan was going to go number one. Keith Van Horn would be the consensus number two choice, but after that, it was a huge wash of uncertainty. Nobody really knew who to pick or who was going to be any good or who was going to be out of the NBA in a few years. Most fans suspected that this class was simply not very good even before the draft happened. With that being said, there were some key players drafted later on. Bobby Jackson, the 23rd pick, was known for being the 6th man of those Sacramento Kings teams. They were competing for a championship in the early 2000s, but due to some unfortunate circumstances, they could not quite reach the finals. However, Jackson was quite popular due to his short stature, but played with an incredible amount of heart and energy. 
The 34th pick was a man by the name of Bubba Wells. You most likely have never even heard of that name before, but he owns the honorable distinction for being the fastest player to ever foul out of a game. On December 29, 1997, Mavs coach Don Nelson inserted Wells into the game with the sole purpose of intentionally fouling Dennis Rodman of the Bulls. Wells would foul out in 2 minutes and 43 seconds, a record that still stands today. At the 42nd pick, Steven Jackson, a player I'm sure you're familiar with. He actually had the 4th best career out of anybody in this class. Multiple seasons of averaging over 20 points a game, a champion in 2003 with the Spurs. A major piece of the Pacers and he also got suspended in the brawl. A major piece of the We Believe Warriors. And he helped lead the Charlotte Bobcats to their first ever playoff appearance. While often erratic and quick-tempered, Jackson transformed himself into a leader and a borderline star as he got older. And finally, last but not least, with the 45th overall pick, the Washington Bullets draft God Sham God. Renowned for his legendary crossovers and YouTube highlights, but unfortunately, he didn't make it very far in the NBA. Sham God played only 20 games before moving overseas. Anyway, that's all folks, that sums up the 1997 NBA Draft. A draft class of a few stars, but everybody else has been long forgotten. It's amazing how little of an impact the rest of the class had. But it will always be remembered as the draft of Tim Duncan. If it wasn't for him, this class would be quite irrelevant. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Do you think, outside of the three stars, this would be the most forgettable class ever? I certainly think so. It's ridiculous how atrocious the rest of the class is. Thank you everybody so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.